Uh, actually, unusual for me to talk to people who barely know me and my work, but also be given five minutes to summarize my entire career <laughs> and then have a conversation. But, um, but it's actually more interesting to talk to people who don't know anything about my work. Um, but as uh, you explained, um, I, I'm Iranian born, but I've lived in the US, I think now longer than in my own country. And um, the first uh, body of work that I made after being proven to be a terrible painter was photography. And um, actually, I'm not a photographer. I don't even own a camera. I actually hire photographers, so I direct the photography, and then I deal with um, the process after. Um, but I'm just going to, since I want to speak very little, have a conversation. The, ser the first serious body of my work, um, after 10 years of not working at all uh, at art, was a group of work called Women of Allah. And this is basically a series of photographs that I did um, that sort of really focused on the Islamic Revolution 1979 and the role of women uh, in militancy during the Islamic Revolution and the whole concept of martyrdom and the idea of uh, being a martyr and what it meant in terms of being in this intersection of love of God and yet cruelty and, uh, and violence and death. Um, and in, for most of those photographs, I posed myself uh, and I photographed friends. Um, and this photography continued later on after I made many movies uh, into this book, a series called The Book of Kings, which was like over 10 years later. And it really was about um, the 2009 Green Movement in Iran. No, it's more than 10 years, it's far more. Um, but it, again, it captures another pivotal moment in Iranian history. If the first one was the Islamic Revolution, this shows a more modern uh, Iranian society, but still battling with uh, people who are fighting against um, tyranny and political oppression, etc. So this body of work was about, I don't know, uh, 65 photographs. I'm going rather quickly. But what you'll see constantly is the female body, uh, I mean, the male and female body being a very significant part of my photographs. And obviously, this inscription of text um, that were uh, poetry by people of Iran. Um, and um, so now I'm going again quickly. Uh, this is another body of work that I did in Egypt, uh, which was immediately um, after the Arab Spring, um, that sort of captured the notion of patriotism and the euphoria around the revolutions that we experienced all over the Middle East, yet the terrible aftermath, which was uh, a lot of genocide and death. Um, the next group, big group of photographs I created in 2015 and 16 was in Azerbaijan, uh, which previously was a part of my own country, called The Home of My Eyes. And in this series, I basically acted more like a documentary artist. I photographed the local people, and Azerbaijan being a place of mixed ethnicities from Turks, Armenians, Persians, and uh, Russians. Uh, but all of the people that I photographed had common hand postures that were very similar to the cushion paintings, the El Greco's paintings. And the theme being the idea of home or the absence of home and what meant to these people. There are little inscriptions written all over their bodies that are their transcripts of the interviews that I conducted. I make a lot of videos. I've been active in media of video since 1998. Um, this was my breakthrough into the art world uh, with video, uh, which won the in Golden Lion in Venice um, Biennial. Um, but it, again, it was literally taking the, the aesthetics of my photographs, but having it move, and now having music uh, and, and choreography and a story that had a beginning, middle, and the end. This is another piece, Fervor, which uh, again, it became a little bit more narrative. But as you can see, they're highly um, stylized and um, very fictionalized. And, um, and these were all shot in Morocco. So by now, I began to shoot videos and films outside of US, uh, mostly in Morocco, in Egypt, in Turkey, in different places. So these are examples.
That's it. Okay. Um, and, and so the next thing I wanted to share with you is that since 2000, no, yeah, since 2002, I've been very busy making feature films. I made a film called uh, Woman Without Men that was based on a magic realist novel that won in the Silver Lion uh, Award in Venice Film Festival that took six years. And I just completed this new film, Looking for Omako Sum, that uh, we will show some clips, um, but that was based on Egyptian uh, singer in Egypt, and I spent 12 years making two feature films, <laughs> and I also did an opera. So that said, we go right to the conversation. Okay. Being an Iranian female living in New York, this informs a lot of your work. You lived in exile, basically, in the United States. Can, can you talk about what it was like to have that happen and what your return to Iran was like, given that that was sort of the starting point of all of your work? Well, at the time when I grew up, uh, there was uh, a lot of Iranian families were sending their children abroad to study because lack of, um, you know, situations at uh, colleges, universities, and so they, we were all sent out. But we didn't predict the revolution. Uh, and at that time, my father uh, sent me and my sisters and brothers, uh, and they all went back. And I happened to be in the U.S. when the revolution happened, and um, so. Unfortunately, um, at that time, I was very young. I came when I was 17. And the revolution happened. Uh, I was in college. Uh, actually, I was at UC Berkeley. And immediately after the revolution, uh, they took over the American um, embassy in Iran. The hostages were taken. So there was an incredibly strong anti-American sentiment. Um, so I found myself alone in a country without financial help and without the, and the loving family around me. Um, but also um, against the wall politically, as there was a strong reaction. Um, so I didn't see them, not for the 20 years, but 11 years, I didn't uh, go back. And, um, and eventually, when I went back, I started to make art. And then the, the country, the government, found my work problematic. Mm. And then since 1996, I have not been back. Wow, and I think that sort of leads us in when you said the government found your work problematic. Your work is highly political, and you often talk about having a social responsibility. So I was wondering if you can talk about the idea of being the voice of a country that you haven't lived in in a very long time. You know, you don't have the possibility uh, to distance yourself from the political reality. and. Is, is that the political consciousness is something that is not a choice. And, and I think that's difficult for Americans to understand, um, that if your everyday life is defined by uh, this and that, for example, this recent breakdown of, you know, again, the, the exit of America from the nuclear deal, mm. it's a huge issue for my family in Iran, for me and the future of us in, as immigrants. And so, um, so I think the work is a manifestation, is, is kind of artistic reflection on the political reality. But it's not a, a, it's not a propaganda. It, it is a rather a kind of a fictional work that somehow tries to shed light on the complexity of the situation. And so I don't see myself as the voice of the country, or, but the fact that um, my work has um, properties in the way that it communicates about the people and to the people of Iran. Well, you've made. You've made photographs, you've made short films, you've made feature length films. Can you talk about how your process changes between each medium? Well, it's, uh, I think that uh, this kind of nomadic behavior is a little bit about my personality because I'm extremely restless and <laughs> nervous. Yeah. And all of us living in a very nomadic lifestyle. I'm, I'm never anywhere for very long. People like me, I'm, I think a lot of us are like that. And, and that we tend to learn very quickly uh, new places, new languages, new food, new environment. It's just a way of life. So it's not, we're not really fixed at any place, any situation. And so somehow I feel like this lifestyle has also been my relationship to the mediums. Um, that I'm not really faithful to anything. I'm not really good at anything. Uh, and I haven't been We educated. think you're good at things. Well, I don't, <laughs> I'm not educated in it. But I, I spend a lot of time, like I said, I spent six years making a film. So I spend a lot of time studying whatever I'm doing. But I give myself the license to feel adventurous and, uh, and, and also to struggle and be on that edge. Because I feel like 
by embracing a new medium, you're reinventing <coughs> yourself. And that's often keeping yourself excited as an as a artist, as a human being. That even as you get old, you feel young, you know, and you fail. And I think that's been my, my nature as a person. And I think, in, in a way, it informs the way I work. Hmm. What's the process over six years of making well, a film? Well, I do other things as well. I mean, <laughs> because I have to also survive as an artist, I do exhibitions. Um, the process of the film has been, first of all, it's script writing, uh, and then finding the right producers, then finding the money, uh, location scouting, and um, actually um, casting, etc. And uh, I think the two films have been the most painful experiences <laughs> I've ever had, worse than giving a birth to a child. <laughs> <laughs> But the point is that at the end of it, I feel like it's a great accomplishment. <coughs> In some ways, I think every frame of the film becomes a photograph. Uh, wow. and, and every few minutes becomes a video installation. And that also you're able to communicate to a larger audience that are not just gallery museum goers. And you're really thinking about the masses and the general public. And I think that gives me a great pleasure. Wow. Um, so I think that's a good point for us to turn to Looking for Um Kultum, which is your most recent film project, one of these projects that has taken um, a very long time to complete. It's a movie within a movie. It's about a Persian director's attempts to film the life and legacy of the Egyptian singer Um Kultum. Um, can you give us a little bit of the uh, backstory about how you discovered her, why she was so fascinating to you? Well, first of all, I have to say that even though my work looks very sociopolitical on the surface, mm -hmm. uh, it, there's always something very personal about the work. It's always been about my experience, my perspective. Not my experience, but the way I, I view things, the way I frame my questions. And, and so it has this very personal um, um, approach. Uh, with looking for Omukosum, um, Omukosum is the, the biggest, the most important artist of the 20th century in the Middle East, without a doubt. Mm. Happened to be a woman, happened to be gay, happened to be non traditional, she never got married, um, she never had children, and yet she's loved by men, by women, the Sunnis, the Shias, secular, non you know, secular, and, and from Israel to Saudi Arabia to Iran to. It, it's an amazing phenomenon. Mm. And, and so this film is about an Iranian woman artist living in exile, uh, questioning the, the, the success of an iconic artist from the Middle East, and really facing um, the question of how can we as women become successful? Uh, and does this mean that we have to sacrifice personal lives and uh, issues that are deeply traditional uh, expectations from, from women? And, and so this woman, myself, I've had a child, and, but single mother. And so how do you navigate between you know, romantic life mm. and traditional role as mothers, but yet uh, pursue your passion and pursue your career and be successful? So it's really a, a question of a smaller artist to an iconic artist. And, and of course, this script was impossible. And, and you know, so if we go in and out of a period film to a, to the film behind that, and uh, highly controversial because she's the biggest artist of Egypt. Um, so it's been showing in the Arab world and interesting reactions. That's actually one of the things we wanted to ask you about is how was it perceived in Egypt and in Iran? Well, the Iranians are upset. They say, why <laughs> can't you find an iconic <coughs> woman singer? Why do you right. have to go to Egypt? Because there's no Iranian artist has ever reached that popularity. Um, and I needed a break from Iran. Um, but I think with the Egyptians, um, it's been uh, uh, really at the beginning, they were like, what? You, you? I mean, not even Egyptians have dared to make a film about her because uh, she's too sacred and untouchable. Mm. And some people say, in fact, maybe this was the best way to approach it as a film inside of a film because we were very honest about this, um, that you know, this is an attempt, this is the vision of Iranian artists, this is not a documentary, this is not mm. a biopic, this is not exactly the story, but this is the way this woman is struggling to tell the story. Mm. Um, and I went with the film to Tunisia, it opened in Egypt, in Lebanon, oh. um, it's opening in Morocco, <laughs> and you know, of course, in a small scale. And, um, but 
But it's interesting that the film is finding its audience. And I think it is not ever a film that would have a huge audience. And it's not targeting a commercial uh, audience. But I think it's something that would last. It would have a life longer because it's a really an artistic project. It's not meant to be you know, anything that you will see in you know, Union Square. You know, what do you call the, <laughs> the movie theater? The regal cinema. Yeah, if it's lucky somewhere. You well, did take it to Toronto, though, uh, and yeah, to the Venice, film festival. Yeah, and it will open in MoMA for a week in July 26th. Uh, and uh, it will have a week run, uh, which I'm very happy about. So go see it. Um, what was it like to sort of take it to the Toronto Film Festival? What was, um, what's it like? You've done a lot of film festivals. You've taken things on the circuit. How does that I think this work one made me very <clears throat> nervous because, uh, first of all, the second film is always uh, very difficult. Uh, so uh, it was an Arab story, and I'm not Arab. So a lot of the audience often are Arab. And, and then you're like, oh, <laughs> they're going to like, throw tomatoes at me. Um, and also that is, is a very artistic film. So you always have a mix. Uh, it's always sold out. The screenings are full and because uh, people love her and everything. But and there's always a great mix of receptions and people who, uh, critics who don't like it, who like it, uh, Arabs who absolutely don't relate to it to those who appreciate it. So like everything I've done, it's never ever like praised completely or destroyed. <laughs> but I'm still going on. So, um, so it's a mixed, but I think slowly it's finding its audience. And in terms of the story and the main character, the film seems to have some reflection of you in terms of um, it's a female director. She encounters um, some pushback from being a female, um, from being Persian. Is this personal? Yeah, it's about my experience. <clears throat> it's about um, you know my own struggles to make this film, my own shortcomings. Even the script we wrote is problematic. It's not a perfect uh, script. And this woman also struggles with the script. Uh, it was just impossible to know how to go under the skin of this incredible, incredible woman. That was a myth. You know, It was not even a human. And she, she actually re wanted to remain as an image. So uh, what I asked for was an impossible task mm -hmm. to devour. and demystify a, a myth that was just impossible. So, I, so in this film, I tried to be really honest about, you know, I chose a very difficult subject, and I didn't completely succeed. And, but, but, but what did I learn about this from her? And what was the angle? What was the obsession about? And I, and I think then, when you get very intimate about the process, there is honesty about the film that, you know, then you, if if you are that kind of person, you understand this film by no means trying to be pretentious or trying to compare me with her, but really showing the artistic practice involving a lot of struggles and failures of an artist, but also doubts. And I think that's something that we don't give credit to the artist, that the process, it's often painful. And it involves taking risk, and that doesn't always succeed in a positive way. But that is part of the process. And I, that's all I tried to show. Uh, and even the film as, at the final, it's not a perfect film. And I'm the first one to say it. But I think that's what it was all about. you know. And what do you think is so imperfect about it? The script, I think, um, because, you know, again, um, the way that we try to navigate between different periods and the story of the Iranian woman versus the story of um, this iconic artist and how to balance everything between the political reality when she lived, her own political reality as a woman in exile. There's a lot of information. There's, there's a lot of um, metaphorical meanings that we wanted to, to weave into the story um, that about women, about being artists that are living within political reality that affects their work and their success and failures. And me as an exilic artist, she as the one who, who became very loyal to the political leaders uh, in order to stay successful. So there was just so much intentions that we tried to build into the narrative that maybe it just wasn't perfect, you know? Um, and, and I think that's okay. It's totally okay. And I, I think one of the things that's interesting is obviously 
this fits into your larger practice in terms of um, you know, an Islamic female protagonist. But you, you often talk about that you're more interested in form than you are in the content. And so I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about how making narrative film sort of fits into your larger practice of photography, of sort of short experimental film, um, and, and if you think you were successful there. I'm, I'm glad you said that because uh, very often people just focus on the theme because I'm Iranian. And but in fact, I think I consider myself among some of the Western also artists who are beginning to break through the, you know, away from the museum and gallery walls and try to experiment with <coughs> what it's like for a visual artist to tell a story. What yep. kind of form would it take uh, without mimicking conventional cinema, but also not making things that are completely incomprehensible. Uh, I also directed the opera last year at Salzburg Festival, Aida, with yep. Uh, and Ernest Rofko and, and Ricardo Muti, the conductor. And, and what is this nature of um, ambitiousness or experimentation? But I think that is happening more and more, where um, both the film festivals, the, the music festivals, and are, are really welcoming artists uh, coming from other mediums to experimenting uh, with this. And, and I have to say that. Um, I, you know, I do photography, I do video installations, I do film, I'm making a new film, uh, and, and I, I you know, still do performing arts. And not because I'm good at all of these things, because I enjoy the process. And I think it's good to give yourself um, the, the goal of being able not to stay stagnated within one form of work. I could have stayed with those pictures, writing calligraphy for the rest of my life, make yeah. bundle of money. <laughs> I make zero money in making films. In fact, I put everything I have from the photography into the film. So it's a kind of stupid because there's money never pay, plays a, in its equation. And, and so I think that's the decision I made. It's a true labor and of I think love. It is, and I, I, I stand behind it, and I will never be very rich. You mentioned the opera. Something that you said that I, I really thought was interesting was you said, sometimes the boundaries between Aida and myself are blurred. Um, what do you mean by that? What's your relationship to Aida? Aida is the story of um, Ethiopian princess in exile in Egypt. And the director of the music festival uh, invited me because Aida just historically has been a highly problematic uh, opera for, for a lot of Middle Easterners and because it's the most cliche and Orientalist uh, um, opera and that sort of um, badly stereotypes the Middle Eastern, even in the ancient times, Egypt and Ethiopians, uh, make them into this very barbaric, um, you know, and, and then the Westerners are the glorified, you know, it's written by an Italian, um, you know, composer Verdi. And so he found it very interesting that if I could take this, which was a huge task, um, uh, this narrative and sort of make a new reinterpretation of it that somehow kept the grandiose uh, of the, cl the classical Aida and, and didn't uh, compromise the value of it, um, but yet was able to address the kind of cliche and and sort of it didn't have the elephants and the horses and the people painted black Ooh. walking. So I took three years and I had to do it. It was also very controversial. It was never um, done in this way. Um, but um, it was completely successful in the way that was really highly attended. But it was also very controversial. That sounds uh, like a huge undertaking, as are a lot of your films now that you're doing. You're doing really elaborate projects. And I want to turn back a little bit to, to your work with film. One of the films or short films that you started with was Turbulent. You went to Women Without Men that you mentioned before. What's sort of happening on your path with film right now? And um, they have this undercurrent, or at least Turbulent does, about music. Yeah. Um, and you talk about the power yeah. of music. So you're a visual artist who is using music. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, again, because so much of my work is about the socio-political religious realities, music brings with it something very gospel, very emotional, something that doesn't need translation. Uh, I think that helps, in a way, neutralize some of the, mm. uh, the nar that political content of my work. Um, and because I think my work is as much about existential, universal, timeless, mm. and emotional issues as it is about 
today's realities and political realities. And I just want to take this point and just mention that uh, another reason that I go toward very stylized or surrealistic uh, narratives, like Woman Without Men was based on a magic realist novel. Mm. And, and, and the reason I feel so comfortable with dreams and surrealism is because it, it, it allows you to make reference to reality, but yet also stay in another place that sort of gives you some space from that. And at the current film that I'm working, I think it's the first time I really talk about it, it's called Dreamland. Mm -hmm. And it's really, in a summarized way, it's about uh, the surrealistic novel that would be shot in the US uh, about Iranian people spying on Americans' dreams. Um, and, and, and it's absurd, it's a political satire, but it, it really is uh, an institution, this kind of Iranian colony that is the future of Trump doing with Iranian people. I would say a refugee camp full of Iranian people, but sort of oddly and ironically, there is an institution within this colony that it's actually a room for interpretation of American people's dreams. And there's a woman who every day goes on the highway to a small little American town, and her job is secretly, she goes as a census worker, door to door to people's homes, asking information at the end, she says, and what is your last dream? People say, dreams? Do we have to tell our dreams? They say, yes, it's part of the survey from Washington. So she's a spy. But she carries their photographs and their dreams back to that colony so they can interpret their dreams. So, so my idea, again, of creating a narrative that very symbolically and an absolutely absurd and satirical way, it sort of critiques this um, tension between two countries, the superpower who dominates the world uh, and the fanaticism right. that exists in the absurd Iranian government. And, and that the humanity in between the two parts and, and, and you know, so there's, uh, this is the story we're doing and I'm hoping we can shoot it in 2019. Wow, well we look forward to seeing that and um, there are so many dichotomies in your work including this sort of um, play with reality versus sort of these more magical, um, fa fantastical, um, sort of aesthetics that you even bring into Um Kaltum and there is a sort of a be a tension between the beauty and um, and also you know the undercurrent of, of what you're you're having to say. I think that's you put your finger on absolutely the right thing. Every single thing I've ever done is about the notion of opposites, the paradoxical men, women, East, West, mm. uh, mysticism and violence and um, you know, Woman Without Men was the orchard and the city of Tehran. Uh, I, I think that's the only way I can think in general about the, the good and evil and all of that. And so I never see anything in one way. Mm -hmm. You were named Artist of the Decade by Huffington Post at one point. That's a pretty, that's a big deal. And you've received a lot of awards and you've worked on so many things. And uh, I, I'm just curious, sort of at this point, you know, what accomplishments are, are you most proud of? Um, and what are you looking to It's interesting, to every next? time somebody says nice thing about me, I say, but really? I, I, guess I, I always consider myself um, a struggling artist, which is, I think it's a good thing maybe. And, I, and I, I know, I, I, everything that I do is so hard to accomplish. And we work so hard, like I work seven days a week. Um, and, and so I never see myself as a success story. And it always blows my mind when people say flattering things. I even criticize my work more than necessary because I, not to be humble, but I, I just see it that way, that it deserves criticism. So I'm very flattered when people say nice things. Well, there are a lot of nice things to say. I think we should, at this point, roll the clip and then we can open it up to Q&A. So I'm saying I'm from Egypt and growing up, we always heard about her sexual orientation as a rumor, not like a confirmed fact. So I was wondering what do you have to say about that and whether the movie addresses the issue at all or not. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm really glad you brought that up because um, first of all, every Egyptian you speak to has a different um, explanation or, or impression and, and, and relationship to Omo Kosum. So what I found also about her sexual orientation, everyone says something different. Some people say she absolutely was in love with so and so, and but she did eventually marry her doctor. Who, you know, at the end when she died, she was married to him. 
uh, and she adopted a son. Um, but in rea uh, many people say that she was absolutely working with men, but in love with women. And she had, um, at the beginning, <clears throat> we, we did a lot of research about that. And we indeed, there was a lot of images and uh, not videos, but um, of her really the time that she laughed a lot and seemed, because when she was performing, she's always very rigid. The time that she was seemed most relaxed was around women, you know. Uh, it seems like she really felt comfortable. Of course, it happens for a lot of women, just even if you're not gay. <laughs> um, but I think everything hinted at the fact that um, for her conservative environment that she lived, it was absolutely out of the question that she could um, be open about it. But, but also the Egyptians didn't really, you know, wanted to devour her personal life in that way, uh, like the way we do with celebrities here, which I really respected. Um, some people I talked to and say, it didn't matter to us, you know. Some people say, oh no, she was not. And some people say, yeah, she was. But in, in general, I, I find that the status that she reached, um, it's, you know, like wildly different, like in, you have Michael Jackson here. I mean, his sexuality, like the biggest, you know, American icon as a pop culture, a pop artist, but uh, you understand that he really was devoured in the way for his celebrity status. But Omikosum, they just loved her music, you know? And, and it didn't matter if she was a woman or a man or, you know, gay or not. And that's what I admired about her and her relationship to her audience, that they didn't destroy her like they, the way we do. You know, Amy Winehouse, uh, Whitney Houston, Edith Piaf, uh, Billie Holiday. Uh, you know, every great artist that we build up, we, we bring down because we just, you know, oh, she was very freaky. And, but in reality, you know, like I said, I found that she has this very sacred place uh, that you just cannot take away from her. And, and people were really the, the most religious conservative community just left her alone because they loved her. You know, and I think that's so rare, you know, and it, honestly, it's something I took a lot of pride that we in the Middle East have an artist in that level of popularity where four million people went. It was one of the largest funerals ever in the history of Egypt after Nasser, I think. Um, in the America, in the West, you've never, ever seen this many people go for even for Michael Jackson to a funeral. The artist just never that popular, and that in in the way that she, you know, it didn't matter her sexuality so much, you know. I hope the long answers. Any other projects you would like to tell us about that are forthcoming beyond the movie that we'll have to wait a couple of years to see? Uh, well, the movie will also have an <clears throat> art component, and right. I'm working on some exhibition in relation to that, but it will be confirmed soon. So it will be both for New York and Los Angeles. So. Hopefully, it will be uh, all in 2019. Uh, so, well, we look well, Thank you for to spending it. your lunch time instead of thank eating. Thank you. <laughs> we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.